I, I, I honestly think that James is one of the most important voices of our times. Uh, I mean, he, he, he's written a, a brilliant book uh, that uh, you all should read. Uh, whether you buy it or not, you should get a copy from the library. Uh, but one of the things that impresses me about James is, is that his thinking is constantly expanding. Uh, so he is uh, uh, a presence in this country that we, sh we should all be watching, we should be listening to his advice. Uh, he has a unique clarity and perspective in his analysis, uh, and he has a lot of appreciation for what happens in the real world and what it would take to change things, how hard that would be, but what kinds of things it would take to bring about uh, real change. So we are just, uh, w w we were fortunate to have him here today. I think as, as a nation, we're, for we're fortunate to have him in the position that he's attaining uh, as one of, certainly one of the most visible legal academics in the country and one of the most visible people, period. Uh, talking about issues of, of race and justice. Uh, now, in contrast to James, uh, I'm going to give you a lot of statistics and facts, almost uncontrovertible facts, but, 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 but many of them are things that people uh, don't know uh, about our country and the current condition. Oh, that's me up there. I wanted you to see the pictures on my PowerPoint. No, I'm tr okay, that's, that's the title of the talk. Um, uh, the, the, the purpose of the talk is, is really to just talk about America and the ways in which we're different from other countries. That's, what, that's what's meant by American exceptionalism. Uh, several years ago at this event, the annual conference for the Robina Institute several years ago, uh, was focused on this uh, subject. In what ways uh, is America unique? Do we really know ourselves? Uh, one way to get a perspective on who we are is to compare uh, how our governments operate and the outcomes they produce with uh, other countries that are most similar to us, that's predominantly other uh, industrialized democracies in the world, that's predomin predominantly Europe and other English-speaking uh, countries around the world. Uh, but also it's worthwhile to compare ourselves with uh, other nations of all kinds. Uh, just try to figure out what, what, our, what our predicament is, what, what kind of circumstance are we living with uh, in this century, if, 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 if we want to think big about an agenda for change in uh, criminal justice, I think we should be thinking big. Uh, what is our starting point? Uh, what's the current problem that uh, we, we have to deal with? So, so, so I want to give you a sense of uh, what we call mass punishment, uh, which covers uh, subjects far reaching beyond mass incarceration. Uh, I think most people in the field uh, have known for years that our incarceration rates uh, lead the world uh, and have done so for some time. Uh, the fact that America is an outlier with respect to the use of confinement in prisons uh, in jails has had a real impact on the discussion of uh, who we are, what we should be doing, a uh, certain degree of bipartisan sentiment uh, that we see around the country. Uh, in Robina's work, we work with state and local governments. We see a lot of uh, appetite for change. We see a lot of fiscal pressure and interest in reducing prison populations just because of uh, the money that that costs. Uh, we see a lot of different intentions uh, but uh, before we can make real change, we need to understand what the current circumstance is and maybe more about what the targets uh, have to be. Okay, so how are we different from other countries? Um, well, I'm going to skip a couple slides. Uh, I, ju I just edited a book that came out on this subject. I, actually, it's a book that um, was based on the conference several years ago. Uh, and it's been revised and rewritten over and over, and, and uh, 
so uh, many of the things I'm talking about are, are from the book, including things I've stolen from uh, all the other authors. Uh, if, if I remember, I'll attribute to them, but you should just mentally realize this isn't uh, uh, just my work that I'm showing you. Uh, in, in, in the death penalty, I think, again, we, most of us know that um, uh, we, we are an outlier as a nation in that the death penalty is, continue, is considered constitutional and legal everywhere. Uh, the majority of states uh, actually have a capital punishment uh, on the books. Uh, compared to the Western world, we are uh, an outlier. Uh, I, I, I would put the death penalty on the list to some degree that James introduced with a juvenile uh, institutionalization, that we've cut rates of confinement of juveniles quite substantially in the last 10, 15, uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, the death penalty is going in the same direction. Uh, although we uh, uh, are one of the few executing uh, countries where I think we're the fourth or fifth most executing country uh, in the world. Uh, if, you, if you can compare us with uh, the societies that, that, that really indulge in capital punishment, uh, we're pretty small potatoes. Uh, measured against population, uh, the U.S. in 2015 uh, executed nine people per 100 million. Uh, so your chances to be, uh, uh, um, for a death sentence to be carried out on you, far, uh, far less than being killed by lightning in the United States. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a very tiny phenomenon. Uh, in the U.S. didn't used to be, but it's a small phenom phenomenon uh, compared to China and Iran, certain other countries that um, uh, are, are, are just in a completely different place, the United States is um, uh, uh, not as bad, or not as bad as it once was. Uh, this chart is from the book. It goes all the way back to the uh, late 18th century uh, and shows you the number of executions in America per one million population uh, from the late 18th century through the, uh, some of the most current numbers. And you can see a steady downward progression. Uh, this is actually a worldwide trend. Uh, that downward progression has gotten to zero in a lot of countries, certainly in a lot of uh, democracies. There is reason to think in the historical sweep of things that we are heading towards zero as well. You know, historical predictions are dangerous, but the long-term trend um, is not entirely bad news uh, in the realm of the death penalty. And, and I'm going to talk about other uh, aspects of American punishment that, that, that affect far, far more people and a greater percentage of our population. Uh, but we do see change in a number of areas in the direction of restraint and lenity, um, greater respect for human rights or the humanity of criminal defendants and, and so on that uh, are at least somewhat encouraging in some domains. Uh, now, in incarceration, we can't be terribly encouraged, but let me give you some of the facts. Uh, uh, you probably know that uh, uh, U.S. Uh, prison rates, incarceration rates, stayed relatively uh, stable, went up a little bit in the first two-thirds of the 20th century. Uh, and then from 1972 to about 2007, 2008, went up steadily markedly and stead steadily just exploded every year for 35 years uh, without interrupting, without interruption. So, so, so that upward um, part of the curve at the right of the graph is where we get, uh, where we departed from the rest of the uh, democratic world uh, and uh, reached a point of mass incarceration. Uh, you can see from that last little bit of the graph on the right that uh, there has been some reversal of that across the country. A lot of it's in California because the Supreme Court ordered them to de-incarcerate. But, the, but there, there has been some reversal. Overall incarceration rates today are about 10 percent less than they were at the peak uh, in 2007, 2008. So there's, there's some change, although we still are experiencing incarcer incarceration rates 
uh, in this nation well above the point where we started to use the term mass incarceration uh, in the year 2000. Okay, so I, I, I like to tell people that that's, even if prison growth goes flat or just goes down by a little bit in the coming years, uh, that is still on the world scale a very aggressive incarceration policy. Going down a little bit, we're still at the top of the charts. Uh, even if growth just stops dead in its tracks, we're still at the top of the charts. Uh, now, one of the most troubling uh, aspects of the incarceration growth we've had in the co this country is that uh, incarceration rates are much, much higher for our minority communities uh, than for the white uh, majority. Uh, this chart is, um, uh, it's, some of these charts will be hard to read, so I'll, I'll just have to describe them to you. Uh, this chart shows you the, the, the black male incarceration rate uh, starting in the left during the Reconstruction era, uh, closely after the Civil War. Uh, uh, th th there were essentially no blacks in American penitentiaries before the end of the war because they were, for the most part, on the plantation. Uh, immediately as we get into Reconstruction, uh, black incarceration rates jumped to about three times uh, white incarceration rates. And what we see through the remainder of the 20th century is steady explosive growth and in incarceration, except maybe for the 1960s, uh, where the overall enterprise of confining people in the country just grew at an astonishing rate. Uh, but the disparities between black and white incarceration rates were also growing at the same time. Okay, so we, we had two trends. You know, the overall pie was getting bigger and the share of the pie that was black incarceration as opposed to white was getting better as well. Uh, not better, was getting larger, was getting bigger. Uh, so we've had a sort of double uh, impact on the black community uh, as incarceration has gone up. Uh, one of the questions we're going to have to face in the coming years if we do bring prison rates down uh, is which is more important if we can't do both? Should we focus upon bringing overall incarceration rates down? Should we focus on the ratio between uh, black and white incarceration rates? Uh, the states in the United States with the lowest overall incarceration tend to have the highest disparity ratios. Uh, and I think we're going to see, we're, we're just going to experience ethical dilemmas if we do indeed. Uh, enter an era of mass incarceration that will be new to this country. I mean, I mean we're, we're going to need insightful voices like James Foreman if things really do start to change. Uh, then in terms of comparing this country to other countries, uh, this graph is from the book. It's from two authors who wrote a chapter comparing the United States to Canada because at least in the, this, this, this graph goes, uh, back only to 1960, uh, but it covers all of the incarceration growth in the U.S. and the dotted line uh, up on top and, co and compares us to what happened in Canada. Uh, we had explosive, uninterrupted growth for 35 years, uh, and Canada basically has the same imprisonment rate today that it had in 1960. Okay, so, so just, just looking at, at a nearby neighbor, at least, you know, ra raises questions. What are, you know, what are the conditions, or what could possibly have caused such different uh, sort of gigantic governmental responses in the United States from at least our closest, most culturally similar neighbor? Uh, this chart you're not going to be able to read, but this 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 is a chart that just uh, 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 compares a whole bunch of uh, nations, mostly in Europe, with the United States. Uh, and what you see at the bottom, the very bottom red line that sticks out further than all of them, uh, is, the Ameri is, the, is the American incarceration rate in 2014. And then all of those other lines are uh, other countries. The second, second place is, is Russia, uh, which is just a little bit above the U.S. line. Uh, at the top of the chart is Scandinavia. Uh, but what we see in uh, 
you know, just in, in comparative net analysis is societies operating, most societies in the world, at least advanced societies operating in far different ways from uh, the, the, the way we do things. Um, this chart is um, just is, is more recent. This is just the 20th century and what, what, is, what has been happening in terms of incarceration rates. Uh, I think in this chart, the, uh, uh, there are seven or eight Western European countries represented, and their incarceration rates are reported uh, for most years in between uh, 2000 and 2016. The, the, the skyscraper at the right of the um, picture is U.S. incarceration rates. Uh, so you get a pretty clear picture that even though we've had some declines uh, since, uh, since the late aughts, since the late 2000s, uh, uh, we, we still stand in terms of our prison policy in a different place from the rest of the world. Uh, one of the things that I think is very important in uh, thinking about America, American criminal justice is uh, that we are really 50 different uh, jurisdictions or 51 different jurisdictions or nations at least in terms of our criminal justice policy. Uh, this is another graph where you can't tell on, on, on the right all the blue bars that are the, the highest ones on the the graph, each one of those represents a different uh, state in America and the incarceration rate in each state. Uh, so Minnesota would be uh, uh, towards the low end of that cluster uh, on the right. Uh, and uh, states like maybe Louisiana, Oklahoma, uh, way, way, way up top. But one thing you see is that even in the United States, uh, incarceration rates vary by more than a factor of six. Uh, between the state that most imprisons uh, its uh, people in its its jurisdiction, as opposed to the least, so we, you know, we have just as much variety within the sort of borders of the U.S. as there is variety in Europe, for example, uh, or other places. Uh, now, over to the left side of that picture, uh, you w comparing the 50 states first to Eastern Europe, which. Uh, tends to incarcerate more than Western Europe. Uh, but as you see, uh, very big differences like the other chart in practice between the U.S. and what, um, certainly what Western Europe uh, uh, ends up doing in prisons and jails. Okay. Uh, now, now, one of the things we've learned, I think it's just hit us over the head uh, like a crowbar in working on the various projects that we've been able to run at the Robina Institute thanks to the Robina Foundation, uh, is that mass punishment in America goes far beyond mass incarceration. And that the kind of graph or charts or statistics we just saw for mass incarceration actually span over an entire range of criminal justice related practices uh, that don't get as much attention. Uh, so I just want to give you some more facts and figures. Uh, in the realm of community supervision, uh, we found that we have more people on probation in this country uh, than other countries uh, in the world. Indeed, we have more people on probation on any given day in this country by a factor of five to ten times as much as Western democracies that you saw earlier in the chart. Uh, we have mass probation supervision in the country, and at least when I started working in the early years of the Robin Inst Institute, I, I didn't appreciate that. That we are just as unusual compared to other nations in the world in our community supervision practices. Uh, a lot of it is just how long we keep people on supervision. It's a big problem here in Minnesota. People, you can get probation for 40 years in Minnesota. Meaningful numbers of people get probation in decades rather than uh, years in this state. Uh, but we have much longer lengths of term than the rest of the world. In Europe, it's uncommon to ever have a probation term longer than two years. In a lot of countries, it's illegal. There's no such thing as probation uh, longer uh, than two years. Uh, but what we've seen in probation, and this is just the United States, is that uh, in the prison growth era from the early 70s through, around, you know, again, around 2008, 
Uh, this is the growth in probation and parole supervision populations in the country. And you see this uninterrupted growth curve uh, that is uncannily like the incarceration curve we've already seen. Okay, so we, 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 had, we had community supervision exploding at the same time that prison and jail populations were exploding. Early in my career, we used to think about probation as an alternative to incarceration. We thought you should put more people on probation. That'll keep your prison populations down. Uh, historically, at least in this country, that uh, you know, hasn't been a big trend uh, nationwide. Uh, Michelle Phelps, who's uh, in the sociology department here, I don't know, she's probably here this morning, uh, has done a lot of work on the state-by-state -state level to try to understand how incarceration rate is, is linked or is not linked uh, to probation supervision rates in particular states. Uh, she's almost the only person in the country working on this issue. Uh, but we have just as much of, of a problem, in, in, in a sense, in terms of our supervision rates as incarceration rates. And this affects far more people. There are about twice as many people on any given day on supervision as there are in the prisons uh, and the jails. Uh, now, the picture I'm showing you here, you can't, again, this is, you couldn't hope to read it. It's on our, the Robin Institute website. Uh, but the, uh, the orange lines or the orange bars on the graph uh, are the, the uh, probation supervision rates uh, for uh, each of the United States that had credible figures. There were one or two states we couldn't use. Uh, so the orange lines are supervision rates on any given day. And the light blue lines are countries in Eastern and Western Europe and their supervision rates. And you see there's, there's not much overlap. Uh, the, 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 the blue lines that sort of get, get a little higher into the scale are, are all from Eastern Europe. Uh, the Western European supervision rates are down there towards the, the, the right where they're kind of petering out so low they barely register on the scale anymore. Uh, but just to give you a close-up, this yellow, um, uh, the, the, the yellow lines represent the average probation supervision rate for the whole country. In the United States, the, the other yellow line, it's almost off the screen on the, on the right side, is the average probation supervision rate in Eastern and Western Europe. Okay. So, you know, what I think one of the big insights we've had, we, we were the, you know, we, the, the research that produced this information was c conducted at the Institute. But one of the major insights we've had is, is that we have mass probation. Uh, we have too many people on probation by far compared to the standards in other countries. And it affects our prison population because all of these people on probation are at risk of revocation and entry into prison. Right? In most states in the country, if you add probation revocations, which are people being sent to prison to, for probation violations, plus parole supervision violations, you get more than half of all prison admissions in any given year, just about any, any state we've worked with, from the revocations that are coming into prison from community supervision. If you have this many people on supervision, a lot of them are going to be headed back to the prison for missing meetings, failing to keep up on their fees, dirty UAs. Some of them go back for crimes. We have a lot less quarrel with that. Uh, but what we see in probation and prison is a feedback loop uh, that is encouraging overall growth in the punitive enterprise and mass punishment in America. Um, oh, this, this isn't quite as vivid as, as I hope. This, this is from one of the chapters in the book, um, and I, I took it from the, the, the page proofs where the press still had its Oxford University stamp on there. Uh, but, but, but what this is showing you is on the, uh, on the left, uh, a pri you know, the prison rate in America, the probation rate in America, and then the parole supervision rate in America, and over to the right is the equivalent rates for Western and Eastern Europe. 
And it's just what I've been saying. Uh, uh, you know, our, our prison bar is much bigger than uh, Europe's prison bar, but, but boy, I mean, probation is just out of hand, right, compared to what's going on in Europe. And we have similar disparities in parole supervision on any given day uh, as, as compared with European use of parole supervision. By and large, it's hard to be on parole for more than a couple years in Europe. It just doesn't happen, yet we, uh, we, we have much longer terms, we have more intensive conditions, we have far more revocations than uh, other countries. Okay, so at least in our consciousness, we started to think, boy, you know, our supervision practices are just as exceptional uh, when it comes to the rest of the world as our prison practices. And we became involved in, especially in Texas, in working on uh, economic penalties, just the financial burden that's placed on, you know, relatively minor offenders often, you know, people on probation. We discovered that in Texas, uh, probation is constituted at the local level, as in most states. But the, the county probation agencies around the state relied upon fees from their probationers for their uh, uh, operating costs. So we, we, saw, we saw counties where 50% of the annual budget was coming straight from fees that they were collecting from their probationers. These are mostly people below the poverty line. Uh, in other counties, it was up to 75% or more of the annual operating expenses for the probationers were being, uh, I, I'm sorry, the, the operating expenses for the probation uh, uh, department were being paid by fees coming from their clientele, even in the poorest counties in Texas, which are really very poor. Uh, and we expanded our analysis to look at the, the whole range of monetary penalties, sort of financial sanctions that we uh, uh, kind of add one on top of another. Uh, in many states, not in every state, Minnesota is not uh, the worst offender in this regard, but in many states, uh, the idea of just putting almost meaningless numbers on the table when uh, pronouncing a financial penalty on criminal, something they could never hope to pay. Restitution and fines and all these fees and court costs and some states you're supposed to pay back your public defender and you, you just add it up. Someone did a study in Pennsylvania and found over 2,000 separate fees that were in place across the state that could come out, reach out and hit uh, um, someone who's been convicted uh, of crime in that state. Uh, now, there's no uh, chart or graph uh, that you can show about economic penalties to uh, compare what we do to other countries. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to do this, to get a metric. I would say, well, you know, do, do they do this in Canada? Uh, is there anywhere in Canada that they charge the sort of supervision fees uh, that many of our states do uh, for probationers. And so, you know, we have good friends in Canada who are in the system, who have uh, spent their careers. And if you say, you know, do, do, you have your, do you have your probationers paying all these fees and mandatory restitution and fine? And, uh, and, uh, and their response is, well, why would you do that? that that'd, that'd make it a lot harder for them to get on their feet, right? I mean, don't you want people to, you know, join the legal economy and be able to contribute to their families and be, become rehabilitated and reintegrated uh, in, in the... I mean, why would you do this to them? They're already the poorest people in the country. Why would you do this? To, and, and yet, in the United States, uh, we have a long list, again, some states much different than others, uh, of almost thoughtful am amounts of money that we that we charge. I, I think sometimes the, the amounts are so high because no one really expects most of them to be able to pay it. it certainly gives them a sense of hopelessness. We, you know, we can never catch up with this. Uh, we're pretty convinced in Texas that, that uh, a significant number of their absconders from probation go on the run because they think they have no hope of paying their fees. They think they're going to prison. Uh, maybe they wouldn't just for not 
paying their fees. The probation services say, oh, no, 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 we wouldn't revoke just because they're not paying their fee. But the probationers believe it, and they are told that that's what would happen. And they live in fear, and many of the, a lot of them go on the run. Uh, a lot of them have a hard time reacclimating to the world because they've got $30,000 in debt hanging over their head that they'll never be able to get to. That's funny, this is not how it looked when I made this slide. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a, a, another, another area of... Oh, and I should have said about the financial penalties, that, you know, the, the large sums of money that we put in judgment sheets and costs and fees and assessments on... You know, that seems to have happened in this country largely in the last 30, 35 years. So if you just try to track, well, you know, did we do this in 1980 or 1975? Did we charge people all this money? The answer is no. The growth curve in terms of financial penalties has, as far as we can tell, very closely resembled that uh, picture I showed you of incarceration rates earlier on or probation. You know, there's just this additive effect where every kind of criminal sanction we've got, except maybe the death penalty, uh, all, we do, you know, all we did for 30, 40 years was ratchet it up, 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 up until we no longer resembled the rest of the world. And collateral, conse collateral consequences, we believe, is a similar uh, phenomenon. Uh, in 1980, there were very few uh, sort of legal restrictions or jobs that you couldn't get or reporting requirements uh, or bans from public housing or food stamps or whatever that would, that, that, that would be visited upon you because you had a criminal conviction. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are a lot of them that are in federal law. There are, most states have hundreds of laws that are collateral consequences. If you're convicted of a crime, there are just all these laws about things you can't do, that you have to do, places you can't live, uh, and so on. And here again, we think uh, uh, that we live in a nation uh, where this really took off at some point in the 1980s, uh, and it's you know, it's certainly legislatively not a tough sell to say, well, you know, how about if we just say all, all felons cannot get an electrician's license or so on. Okay, so some states have rules like that uh, that really limit what people can do. And the collateral consequences stay with people, most of them for their entire lives. Right? So we're not talking about, you know, in the death penalty we have 20, 30 executions a year. Uh, in the United States, we have 70 million people with a conviction on their record that are subject to dozens or hundreds of collateral consequences that affect their lives. Uh, again, we've made some effort to try to figure out, is this the way it works in other countries? Uh, there's a chapter in that book that I edited that compares the landscape uh, in a lot of European countries. As far as we can tell, no one else in the world does this to its ex-offender population. Okay, so once again, we see the dramatic growth in the type of sanction we're talking about. It's not just incarceration. Uh, every form of criminal punishment or sanction that's widely used, that touches meaningful numbers of people, uh, has pretty much grown at the same rapid rate in the late 20th century. Uh, and now we are left with that uh, as the, the, the sort of picture, the, the sort of just the factual scenario uh, that we all need to know about in thinking about what's next. Uh, uh, what do we hope for in the next 10 or 20 years? Focusing just on the prisons and jails isn't going to be enough because this is you know, I, I mean, I'm confident the book just came out. I mean, I just saw the first copy of the book last night. Um, and uh, I'm confident that uh, today, if we thought hard, hard enough about it, there are many other chapters that we could uh, add in terms of America as an outlier, uh, particularly compared to other Western societies. Uh, I've seen statistics recently on the rate of police shootings in the U.S., compared to those in Europe, and as you might expect, um, very much higher.
I think that, I, I think the, you know, the, oddly enough, it surprised me, the European country with the most police shootings per capita was Denmark. Uh, but it was 1 20th the rate of police shootings in the United States. Uh, so there, I mean, just lots of ways in which we're different. Um, you know, many of us have ideas about what to address, but the, the purpose of this presentation was really just to describe to you uh, what we mean by mass punishment, how we see the overall scene, what we have learned as an institute in our work uh, over the last four or five years. And, you know, we to some degree remain optimists because why would you be in the business if you didn't believe uh, that things uh, could change? But we, but we are starting uh, in a very, uh, I mean, an exceptional, and America is an exceptional country in all of these domains and more that I haven't uh, mentioned. And hopefully, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that it, wasn't fa that it was sort of out of fashion to compare ourselves with other countries. Uh, in the legal business in the Supreme Court, the last thing you would want to do was say, well, here, look, this is how they do it in Europe. That wasn't considered a legitimate a, a legal argument in the Supreme Court, and I think we've been pretty insular as a nation in our criminal justice practice, that we, that we know best, we don't have to learn from uh, anyone else. Uh, in this milieu in the 21st century, I, I, I hope that can change, uh, because there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of variety, there are a lot of different ways of doing things beyond the borders of the 50 states, just as there is a lot of variety within the 50 states themselves. Okay, now I think I'll stop there. If there, uh, if, if, if there are questions, we can, we can go to that. A uh, quick question, as a, since this is a primarily a Minnesota gathering and I'm part of Minnesota local government, have we done anything that looks at this at a county-wide level from a statewide perspective so we can start to look really more locally if we're trying to make our systems actually work as systems? And so because we do so much of our implementation at the county level, the county yeah. level um, I think is a really important way to break things down and wonder if you've done that or plan to do it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean we've, done, we've done quite a bit of uh, county level uh, work with um, uh, probation in Minnesota. Uh, we, we've worked quite a bit with Ramsey County and Hennepin County. Uh, what, you know, what, what, one of the puzzles is that Ra Ramsey County has much higher probation revocation rates than Hennepin County. Uh, you know, I mean, two, two cities right next to each other, but the way their probation services are running is uh, very, very different. Uh, we've worked with some of the rural counties uh, in Minnesota. Uh, right now, Kelly Mitchell, our director, uh, is working on uh, legislation uh, or a policy initiative to try to shorten uh, probation terms in Minnesota, which are which are outrageously long. I mean, we, we, we have the fifth highest probation supervision rate in the nation. We have the second or third lowest incarceration rate, but we've got these, you know, these these long, long terms of supervision compared to other places, certainly compared to other places in the world. Uh, so in, in our probation project, we've worked primarily at the county level uh, in Minnesota uh, and around the country. Uh, we've worked with one statewide system in Massachusetts because that's how it's uh, been organized. But, 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 but for issues like probation, prosecutorial power, um, uh, you know, there, there's you know, the local unit is really uh, what matters. Uh, there are other important agencies like parole boards that have a lot to do with many states' prison policy. The parole boards are probably more powerful when it comes to setting prison policies across the country uh, than anyone else in the states that, that, that have working parole boards. Uh, and yet that power is concentrated at the state level in several people you know, maybe five to 14 people on parole boards in, in different parts of the country. So, so in parole, we work at the state level. And we see, well, here's, and, 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 and there are a lot of issues, as James said, 
there are a lot of issues where the only point of access, unless you're talking about legislation, like just shortening the maximum probation term in Minnesota, you can do that legislatively. But a lot of the changes that need to occur at the county by county level, because one of the, one of the things that's unusual about this country is we do criminal justice at the local level. It's very hard to find any other nation in the world that does that. Uh, but that means that reform is, you know, fragmented. Bob. Uh, Kevin. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 we'll get to you next. <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any statistics on crime rates. So you know, from a lot of the graphs we saw that in the, starting in the 70s, um, the incarceration rate increased significantly each year. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, I mean, have has crime rates had a equally significant decrease in response to that? Right, right. Well, it's, I mean, I, I think this is an equally important subject. I mean, the, you know, the, I mean, the book that I just edited is called American Exceptionalism in Crime and Punishment, right? Because, I mean, as a society, what, what happened to us post-World War II is our crime rate started going up, particularly serious violent crime. Uh, compared to other uh, industrialized democracies. Okay, J James Foreman alluded to this. I mean, one of the things I admire about James's work is, is, is that, 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 that he sees, he's, you know, he, he sees how frightening this was to people. And he doesn't deny that this, this is what happened. Uh, and let, let me just see, I have a couple slides coming up later in this presentation. Um, uh, th this, this is a, um, a, a chart that goes from um, early 1960s to early 1970s. And James mentioned that uh, during that period of time, the homicide rate in the U.S. doubled, it more than doubled. Um, the other lines there are for other you know, serious violent crimes like uh, uh, rape, uh, robbery, aggravated so assault. And they went up even more, uh, according to national crime reporting statistics. And as I look at the history, one of the things that happened in black and white communities across the 60s and into the 70s was that this was terrifying to many people. This was, un this was unsettling. It was hard. I mean, I was a kid in the 60s. I remember. Uh, uh, growing up and how, you know, how dangerous you felt the cities were uh, to go into and so you know my, my own sense of things is that this sort of decade of rising crime was um, it, it, it became a sort of imprinted on the culture uh, not only because crime went up over 10 or 12 years but for the next 20 years it stayed up after it got there Right, so you've got this crime spike, I call it, in the 60s, early 70s. And then let's see, I've got, a, I've got a later slide here sometimes I show. The crime spike is the red line. But then from the early 70s to the early 90s is what I call the crime plateau. So this, this graph is showing you homicide, other crimes could be shown. That as shocking as the 60s were in terms of escalating violence, serious violent crime, uh, we stayed way up uh, in crime rates uh, through the early 90s. Over t so that's more than a 30-year period of either crime spike or sustained high crime rates. And I, you know, I, 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 think it, I, I think it influenced the national character. I think it couldn't, couldn't help, but I'm not proud of the way we, we reacted, but I think we have to understand that crime when, now, 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 since the early 90s, crime has generally been dropping, including serious violent crime. Okay, I think I might have a slide here at the end. Uh, this, this slide is homicide rates in the U.S. and other English-speaking countries, I think. Canada's there, England. And o over at, at the right, you see the, uh, um, the highest you know, bars are are always the United States when it comes to homicide, just as the highest numbers are always uh, the United States when it comes to incarceration. 
Uh, but what this is showing you is that um, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in recent decades, the homicide rate in the U.S. has fallen, and um, you know, hopefully it's, there's some signs it might be turning up again in some cities. That's very worrisome. But up until recently, American violent, serious violent crime rates have dropped quite substantially. But we are still at levels much, much higher, three times, four times, uh, uh, what, what other democracies experience. Okay, so we still have, the, and, 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 I, and I do think this has cultural significance. I mean, you know, how often can you watch the news without hearing about another, you know, murder in your city or another mass shooting in the country? Um, you know, we, we, we remain exceptional, not just in the amount of punishment we dispense, but also in the amount of serious violent crime we experience. Okay. Oh, sorry, Bob, it's your, your Oh, uh, going back to the collateral consequences, I just want to mention that uh, there is legislation pending to adopt the Uniform Collateral Consequence of Conviction Act, which does provide some relief. And as you know, c these are penalties applied outside the criminal justice system. They operate by op they, they're imposed by operation of law. And in Minnesota, it's pretty inflexible. And uh, this act, uh, which you've supported in the past, I know, testifying, uh, would provide some relief. So if anybody wants to get involved in that, the legislation is pending. Right, right. I, I mean, that's, it's, it's an important event that's going on in the state right now. There are very few states that have taken an interest in generally addressing the problems of collateral consequences of conviction, but Minnesota is at the forefront uh, of that. Uh, you know, again, what, you know, one of the things about collateral consequences is it's, it doesn't get the headlines that the death penalty gets or the mandatory minimum sentences get or mass incarceration. Uh, but it almost seems to us that, that if you look at all American criminal punishments, uh, the more people they affect tend to be at the lower levels. So the economic pe uh, penalties are, you know, only a few people executed in the, in the, in the country each, you know, each month, or hopefully not even that many. Uh, but when you get down to the level of collateral consequences, economic penalties, uh, probation and parole, that's where we're talking, you know, a, a, a really large chunk of the nation's people on any given day uh, are affected by what we're doing, far more than the 2.2 in prison and jail. Okay, seeing no more questions, so I will uh, turn the podium over to my colleague Richard Fraze, who uh, he actually has some important uh, things to tell you and some uh, ideas about what we can do about them.